like if you're someone who is building a business, you kind of need to like learn everything very quickly on the fly because you know just things are like crazy situations are coming out of nowhere constantly. Right. Like that's just running and building a business. Hello and welcome to the Leverage Three Podcast. This is the show that helps you leverage the talent and tactics of high performers. I'm Craig Shoemaker, and today's guest is Andrew Marshall. Now, Andrew has built and sold over $104 million of courses serving over 107,000 students. And now, Andrew teaches educators to build businesses and businesses to build education platforms. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Craig. Delighted to have you here. And it seems like our our interests collide in, in so many different ways. But I thought what would be fun is to kind of give you a chance to sort of set the stage a little bit and you know, tell people your story. How did you get started in this business? And then we also have to talk about your raid. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So how did I get started? So I uh, always loved technology, loved learning about technology when I was growing up. Um, thought I would be an engineer, but at the last minute, I kind of changed course, realized that I didn't want to have to put in, you know, 80 to 100 hour weeks studying in, you know, the University of Waterloo's engineering program. And so I decided to take business. So I took business at Western uh, in a competitive program there as well, uh, the Ivy Business School. And it was a pretty good experience, but I've still always loved tech. So when I graduated, I tried to figure out how could I combine the two. Um, I was able to join a venture capital fund that was focused on enterprise SaaS investments. Um, and for a year there, while I was there, we deployed about 12 million of capital, so about a third of the fund or so. Um, across six deals, we did a lot of interesting investments, including Neulogy, uh, Vena, Method, 360 Incentives. I think they changed the name, but uh, it was a great experience. Learned a ton. And while I was there, though, I kind of realized that I didn't like being on this side of the table too much. Um, it, it just kind of felt not predatory, but it wasn't the same as like building an actual tech company. Um, and so what I did was I, I co-founded a business and it was called Bitmaker and it was Canada's first web development bootcamp. Um, and the reason why I chose that is I saw this uh, kind of model popping up all over the place uh, and there wasn't really one in Toronto yet. Uh, and um, I realized that every company that we invested in, they used the funds that we gave them to either you know, hire technical people or hire salespeople. And there was a real gap in both those talent pools, um, particularly technical. And so we, we built this bootcamp, um, my co-founders and I. And yeah, we, you know, I ran it for the next six years. Uh, I sold it to General Assembly, which is the biggest player in the space. And uh, then I, I took some time off, um, much needed time off because it was kind of a a crazy, uh, very exhausting uh, time building that kind of business, especially right out of university. Um, and uh, then I built another agency that's focused on education sales. And I still run that business now. It's called Perforo. Um, and we have a few clients, so it's kind of a boutique business. Um, but, but now I want to you know, get back into building my own education products because I, I love teaching. Um, I love building education products. I love learning. Um, it, it's really like the reason I get up in the morning. And uh, so I, I want to focus on teaching teachers how to build businesses and then, how to, and then also teaching you know, entrepreneurs uh, how to build courses. So kind of two sides of the same coin. You know, maybe right. there's two tracks in the, the program. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of my story for, for now. So, so the boot camp, t tell us, for people who aren't familiar with the, the technology space, yeah. kind of describe that environment and also the, the life cycle, like it, it started out kind of in person and then sort of migrated yep. its way to the web. What's the story there? Yeah. So um, story there was that not everyone needs to take a two or four year program to learn how to code or learn how to design or learn internet skills. Um, when we started the business, there were online offerings, but not that many. Um, a lot of the technology wasn't there and even the content libraries just weren't that built up. And people still wanted to go in person to a place to learn from credible instructors. There was still kind of like a, you know, fear for buying things online. And Shopify barely existed when we started that business <laughs> in 2012. So it wasn't like a, it wasn't a big thing. And people were not comfortable building, buying something, you know, as expensive or as important as education online yet. So um, we built it and it's, uh, it was a nine week program to start. 
uh, and then it evolved into a 12 week program. Um, and it's stayed as a 12 week program as far as I know, but people would come in person. They would have a lecture in the morning and then they would have lab time throughout the rest of the day. Uh, there was office hours for, you know, kind of catch up and then also enrichment in the evenings. Um, and then there was guest speakers, uh, tours of local technology businesses, a bunch of career programming, um, all that stuff. And it was a very intense program. Like, uh, you know, it's not a joke when they call it a boot camp. Like, it's what you expect out of a boot camp, um, at least if you're taking it seriously. And Lots of uh, push-ups along with your keyboard strokes, <laughs> I would imagine. I mean, we had yoga, but if it was only up to me, <laughs> there, there would have been a lot more push-ups. Um, but that, that's fine. I got some pushback on that. And so, you know, I listened to my team um, and we, we didn't implement that. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we, we did that at first. And uh, as kind of the market changed, more online options started popping up. Um, and, you know, I noticed that as far as running this as, as a single location, um, the business model is okay to, to operate, but it's not something that's so great that, in my opinion, I wanted to scale to a bunch of different geographies. And so at that point, it becomes kind of like a, you know, you take one of two roads. You either pivot to providing online services, which we could have hired up to, to do that. We probably would have needed to take on funding. Um, we were bootstrapped at the time uh, and bootstrapped till exit. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't so crazy about that for, for a few reasons. Um, one is just like, do I really like, you know, teaching this kind of thing? Do I want this to be the rest of my life? And then the second option was to sell. And so, um, you know, I went through the whole selling a business process, finding multiple buyers, um, you know, not really having a massive bidding war because some were very like, you know, much more qualified than others and kind of had the same vision as I would have had. Mm -hmm. And so we landed on selling to GA and I stuck around for the next year and a half or almost two years um, while I, you know, completed the obligations of my contract and made sure things were kind of in, in good hands as I handed them off. And uh, yeah, d during that time, we saw a, you know, during that six year period running the business, we saw a massive increase in the availability and the professionalism uh, of online providers. And, mm -hmm. you know, in, in my opinion, and this is across all uh, areas of education, unless there is a like, you know, physical lab requirement. So say you have to be in an operating room or say you have to be working on an engine physically. I think that education is just going to move online more and more. Um, I think that it is a much better delivery mechanism than most classroom settings, at least for, you know, if I'm just absorbing instruction, maybe group work still might be better in person, but you can do that just fine over voice chat on Slack or Discord or, or whatever at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as just receiving instructions or, you know, the, the kind of one to many uh, model that most classrooms have, Online is just superior. Um, you can put a lot more production muscle into making like it engaging. Uh, you can, you know, you don't have to replicate it every single time from scratch with people of like teachers of varying skill sets and varying instructor quality, or at least, a, you know, oration quality, let's say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think online is the future. And I saw that as I was running the business and it's only increased the six years after I've left. Or, yeah, I guess six years at this point. Right. Which is five or six years anyways. It's wild. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely the future of, of where things are going. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, it'll continue to be uh, just more and more prevalent with online options, kind of eating the lunch of uh, brick and mortar players. And I think that's, that's how it should be. Hey, do you want to get parts of these interviews that aren't available anywhere else? Where well, you can join the Leverage 3 email list and get access to exclusive content just for subscribers. So go on over to leverage3podcast.com and sign up today. Well, and I, I certainly want to dig into this more, but I, I, want, I want to take a quick pit stop and talk about that one morning where you got up, you're eating your Wheaties, you know, the birds are singing outside, you go to work, and then all of a sudden there's this very loud and disruptive slamming at the front door and there's badges involved and like, like, tell us a bit about that day. Yeah, I mean, so it was in June. Uh, I think it was the second week in June. We had just started our second cohort uh, of students. 
Um, the first cohort was 24 people. The second cohort, we were able to grow it to 40 um, because of increased demand. And it, it was kind of you know tight in the office, but we added a bunch of additional instructors to try and you know compensate for that. And it was, well, I think the second week of class for them. And um, one morning, I'm in the back office uh, with my co-founders. And one of our students just comes in and bursts through our, our, our doors. And it's like, there's people here from the government. And I was just like, no. <laughs> like, well, what are, you, what are you even talking about? Do they like, want to learn to be a web developer? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, is this a, you know, like fire code violation? Like, what, what are we talking about here? And so I go to the front and meet with these two people. Um, and they, like, at that point, when I kind of confronted them, they were like, essentially yelling um, at, at the students, uh, yelling at the teachers. Uh, they made a whole, like, kicking, like, it was like, it was being raided. Like, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't like an actual SWAT team, but like, it was a couple <laughs> steps removed from that. And they had these like crappy little laminated badges that they kept telling me were real. And I just kind of looked at them like, nah, this, nah. <laughs> but anyways, I, uh, tried to kind of contain the situation by saying like, hey, hey, come back to our like back offices. Like you're interrupting class. Like these people have paid to like receive education. Like you're, you're really compromising the student experience here. And so I, I brought them to the kind of back room and um, talked to them and kind of, you know, heard them out, uh, got, on the, got on the phone with my lawyer um, and, you know, was informed that these people were in fact real. Uh, and this wasn't some kind of like, you know, episode of Punked or uh, other kind of prank <laughs> show. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, at that point, when these people are here, you have to at least be somewhat compliant. Uh, because you don't know, like, can they actually call the cops on you? You don't really know how they're going to escalate and, and what they can do. So we were pretty compliant with them. Um, we understood what they were talking about. We heard them out. And they left and they took some student records with them. Um, they, uh, yeah, they, they asked for a bunch of stuff that we didn't give them right away, but we gave them a bit, just enough to you know, show that we're willing to cooperate. This is still very new to us. This is very shocking. Uh, we're 22 or 23 at the time, and this is my co-founders and I. And yeah, we were just in shock, I think, because the absurdity of the situation. Um, I remember one specific part of the conversation that will motivate me and haunt me until the day I die, probably. <laughs> and that was uh, when I was asking, oh, how did you hear about this? Was there a student complaint? Was there some kind of issue? And the person who was who was there who was probably you know in his 60s early 60s at the time was saying like no actually we read the globe and mail article which is a big newspaper in canada about how you were getting successful student results and i, I kind of was like okay so you you see that we exist you see that we're succeeding and thus you are trying to close our operations um and, and we had a kind of a back and forth about this about like what you know, where does their jurisdiction lie? Like, are they able to enforce this kind of policy on accelerator programs where, you know, students will take the program in exchange for equity in their business? Um, or is it just like, you know, if you're a, a school, in their words, charging cash to students, are they able to kind of, you know, shut you down? And um, he said that, like, the, and again, these are the words that will haunt me. He said that, had you not got the student results, we would have less of a case against you. And <laughs> just hearing it's that... Just so backwards. <laughs> yeah, absolutely preposterous. Um, hearing that was just the, kind of the, the fire that I think, you know, myself and my co-founders needed to get riled up to, to really, you know, kind of push to make things happen. So over the next two weeks, it was all out, all, you know... Uh, Five of the, the co-founders were really, you know, trying to make things work in, in their own ways um, and trying to, like, prevent this shutdown uh, because us as founders of the business, well, we all individually faced up to a year in jail and I think, you know, over $100,000 of fines. Um, and at 22 or 23, uh, that's kind of a lot. That, that's a lot to, to be able to process. Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, we preemptively... Uh, well, we, we started talking to lawyers who were, you know, specialists in this field. And they told us that 
the, the government or, you know, whoever the ministry in charge of this has a mandate that almost makes it seem like they do not want private education to exist in the province or, or in the country at all. Um, and, you know, they let it because they, they're told to effectively and they, they understand the market need in some ways, but they don't like to, to let it exist, or at least it doesn't seem like it. Um, and, and this is what the, the lawyers who have to deal with this kind of thing all the time are, are telling me. And their instruction was to kind of just stop operating and quietly try and work this out with the government. Just be quiet. And so with the, the co-founders and I, we, we thought about this a lot. And if we are quiet, um, completely quiet, if we stop operating and if we're quiet, we just, we end up going out of business because we have a lease. You know, this is a real business with fixed costs. We have employees on the payroll that we've hired. We have a office space in downtown Toronto, which we're teaching out of. Um, we have, you know, rented iMacs that are attached to our, you know, personal credit ratings that we have to pay for. Um, we have all the costs of a real business. It's not just shutting down an online business where there's like, it's easy. You can click a few buttons and like maybe you prepaid for an annual subscription of something and you're out of that cash. But it's not, it's not nearly the same when you have, you know, 4,000 square feet in downtown Toronto to pay for. Um, right. In addition to all the employees that you need to make payroll. And so we realized that if we shut down, if we stopped operating and were quiet, we were done. Um, we just evaporate everything that we had worked so hard to build. Uh, we'd, you know, ruin the name for the alumni. We'd, uh, not be able to fr- provide like ongoing assistance to the people who are still looking for jobs. Um, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Like we would just be dead. Uh, and you know, at best we would be able to raise some money to like try and fight this. But with a government agency, they can just drag their feet and just like bleed you dry. Um, while you're trying to do this. And they'll, they'll move as quickly as, you know, they want to move. And so, yeah, so they can outlast us very easily because, you know, they can print money, um, being part of the government. And so we realized like, okay, we have one shot. We have to go as loud as humanly possible. And we did. Um, we preempted any kind of cease and desist by stopping, uh, operations. And it was pretty interesting because the students, uh, were still allowed to come in the space, but we just weren't allowed to teach them. So they would come into the space and they would teach each other. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were going to get cute with it and have the instructors volunteer for a few hours here and there. But we tried to abide as best we could uh, by the, um, you know, the regulatory as well. And we, we even had uh, some of our instructors start producing online resources that the students could then access. And, you know, the servers weren't in on-premises. So... This is just free online resources that the students are accessing. Um, but we, uh, yeah, we, we preempted the season to assess and then we just went as loud as humanly possible. And we got featured in pretty much every, you know, major Canadian newspaper, um, in one form or another. Uh, people were tweeting about us. So like Paul Graham was tweeting about us. Chamath was tweeting about us. Uh, Vinod Kosla was tweeting about us. Uh, because the, the situation was absurd. Like, this is clearly like a, a talent gap that exists in the market. Um, that there is like, you need as many potential options to try and fill that gap as possible. That includes, you know, public universities, public colleges, and then private institutions, both, you know, physical and online. Um, and at the time, online wasn't, you know, that viable, uh, at least not viable compared to today's standards. So yeah, everyone thought, uh, you know, People were just nuts. Like we, the ministry became kind of like the butt of every joke um, for like a, <laughs> you know a, a week there, uh, right. and eventually the there was there was enough uh, like let's say popular demand that this kind of thing be allowed to exist. That the ministry was willing to kind of cooperate with us begrudgingly, um, and you know they they let us uh, you know become kind of a professional development program. Um, That's incredible. Yeah, it, and it's it's interesting to see like that kind of like stifling of innovation, especially in the education space um, at that time. Because now, like this ministry has like it only has teeth when it comes to places located in Ontario. And like if I wanted to teach a bunch of people in Canada or Ontario, I would just you know locate myself elsewhere 
Um, and then because the internet exists, people could just take my services from wherever. And suddenly this small regulatory office in Ontario or wherever it is in Canada can't really do anything. Um, yeah. So that, that's where, where, where I was curious to, to know what you pulled from it. Like, how, how did that, that situation, that experience, how does that affect you today and how you mm. approach what you're doing now? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think there are a lot of takeaways. Like one, it definitely turned me into uh, more of a libertarian, um, <laughs> is, is what I'd say. Uh, but, uh, I would say beyond that, I think it's like the, just the move to online and the fact that if you are online, like you can move wherever, like there are obviously regulators that like, if you're doing something extremely, you know, negative, yeah, say you're, sure. yeah, like, and there should be like, business or there should be like governments that can crack down on that. Um, yes. But if you're just trying to provide education, uh, then I don't really think that there should be, you know, the ability to just take, uh, you know, sh shut you down and just like t take that away. And I know at the time that we, we came up with so many different solutions that were kind of like, okay, well, we have plan A. And if the government doesn't like agree to this, then we have plan B and we have plan C and we have plan D. And there were so many workarounds um, that like one of them in included, we're going to take all of the students here and we're going to go to Thailand for the next three months. And then we're <laughs> going to teach them there and we're going to come back because we're, and you know, we're, we're all like business grads. We're, we're looking at the numbers. Like I, I have a spreadsheet somewhere where it shows like, this is the cost of getting everyone on a plane to Thailand. And this is the cost of, um, you know, <laughs> being at one of those, these hostels for the next three months for the 24 people we have. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a solution. This is a potentially viable solution. Um, and there are other things too, like th there are things about how you charge students. And at the time, the government wouldn't recognize Bitcoin as a currency. And so could we get around it by charging students in Bitcoin? Like that was something that was, you know, thrown around. Fascinating. But I think the, the biggest thing is when you're running an online business, you can just pivot so much easier. Um, you know, you can pivot around these things just so much faster than if you have an actual office space. And that's, that's the same with like staffing up a big team. Like, I think that the, the biggest takeaways from this situation where you just need to be so flexible early on that like, I wouldn't really advise any, especially first time entrepreneur, especially first time entrepreneurs with a bunch of student debt. I wouldn't advise you start a brick and mortar business. Um, and th this was true at the time. And I kind of knew this working in uh, venture capital and investing in enterprise SaaS companies. But um, still, I, I thought the opportunity was cool. You know, I liked working with my co-founders at the time. Um, I, I thought it was a neat thing to, to do. And, you know, the market need was definitely there. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would just go back to like, you need to be agile when you're starting out because... You know, if suddenly you need to change your entire direction, but you had to hire a bunch of full time people, well, then maybe they don't fit the new direction. And so you need to lay them off and completely upend their lives. And like, that's not fair to them either. Um, likewise, you know, if you start, if you sign a big lease, like you, it's not easy to just get out of that. Um, right. if you have to buy furniture, if you have to do leasehold improvements, all those things, you know, it, it's not, they it's not easy down. to pivot. Yeah, they, they're anchors. Um, yeah, exactly. and, and obviously, you might need them, but they are anchors. And so when you're just starting out, like try and build an anchor-free business in a, as many ways as you can. Um, what, what I think is incredible about that, that story is, of course, the fact that your, your company and your, your partners prevailed you know, in that situation. Mm -hmm. But I think more fascinating is to see the creativity that you applied to the situation most people don't get to a point to where they're like, okay, well, if plan A doesn't work, we can go all the way down to plan D when we're working with a government agency. I mean, that, that's just absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, again, very smart group of people. Um, too many cooks in the kitchen was the problem with that whole situation. <laughs> but, you know, everyone's gone on to do really great things after that. And, um, you know, I don't think there's going to be a getting the band back together anytime soon. Um, right. but, but that said, uh, yeah, we had like so many plans. We had plans on top of plans. And when you're competing with people who are confused that you can learn things through Google, um, which is kind of like <laughs> the, you know, kind of who we're up against, it's not, right. it, it's not that difficult. Um, 
you know, the the only problem is ultimately they have final say, so you need to play along yeah. or at least play play, you know, d- defer to their authority enough um, to kind of get by. Sure. So now, when you're working with the context of if you have these two sides of the same coin, I love the, uh, the way you put it that way. Mm-hmm. You have educators who want to learn how to build a business. You have entrepreneurs who want to learn how to educate. When yeah. it comes to educators who are entering this market and want to figure out a way to build their business, are there certain mindsets that you see that need to be overcome or common obstacles? Mm. What's, what's the story there? Yeah. So I'm still very early on in the process and I'm still kind of like vetting it out with both target markets. But what I would say is that a lot of people who become educators, they, it's almost like the opposite of being a business person in a lot of ways. Um, where I'd say you have almost opposite skill sets uh, in the sense of like, as an educator, you need to be very empathetic. Um, I think, you know, business people are becoming more empathetic over time because it is a, like, you know, hidden weapon for them. But ultimately, like as a business person, you need to look at the viability of the business. And obviously, customer satisfaction and customer success matters. But if you are, you know, spending, and I experienced this firsthand, if you are spending you know, until 11 p.m. with students every single day to like make sure they like understand and, and dealing with like the, you know, the aha moments, but also dealing with the breakdowns and the tears like that, that'll just burn you out. Um, and as a kind of a business person, you, you might not be super well equipped to, to deal with that. And I know I wasn't when I started the business. Um, you know, I've gotten better now, but it, it's still difficult. Uh, but I would say, yeah, teaching teachers that the, the actual business has to be viable for them to continue to operate it because otherwise they'll burn themselves out otherwise they they won't enjoy this they'll kind of like lose their like you know uh lust for teaching like their mm-hmm. their raison d'etre to like actually um you know teach people if they are completely you know 100 percent just you know struggling through with every single student constantly and not setting boundaries and not treating it like it's a business. Like if you and I, and I know like other founders and in other industries have experienced this, where the business model that they entered into wasn't viable, and the only way they made it work was by putting more of their effort into it, and mm-hmm. that is a trap. Um, it will grind you down and kind of leave you with nothing at the end uh, if you pursue that. And even if it is like you know, say it's your hobby, say you love, say you love selling tea. For example, and like that's all you ever wanted to be was like a tea salesperson who you know would make their own different types of tea and market their tea and do all those kind of things. If the business model doesn't work and you have to like you're you know making less than minimum wage operating this for a prolonged period of time, you're gonna end up not liking tea. Like you're not gonna want to you know do that <laughs> past right. a certain point. And so yeah. you know, kind of overcoming the. They care a lot about their students, uh, and they really should care a lot about their students. But they also need to remember that this is a business, and if the business doesn't like work, if the business does not function properly, then there's nothing for the students. There's nothing for the students. There's nothing for them um, right. because they won't be able to keep doing this. They'll just have yeah. to shut it down. Um, so yeah, that, that's one thing I definitely see. So, uh, and then on the other side of the coin, when you're dealing with entrepreneurs, what are the hurdles do they have to get over? I mean, I would say it's almost the opposite, right? And it's you, <laughs> you like that. That is one of the things where, um, well, actually, two things. So, you know, you do have to like really, you know, go the extra mile to make sure like your students are getting it. Um, I think that people who are entrepreneurs are inherently self starters because that's why they became entrepreneurs. Um, your students are not necessarily inherently self starters. Uh, they might be. Um, but but a lot of them might not be, and so there's a level of handholding that that gets required a lot of the time that I think entrepreneurs just like don't get. Like I know, you know, when I started, it took me a while to actually understand this. Where it's like not everyone, you know, is wired in kind of like the same way. Like people are wired super super differently. And when it comes to learning things, like a lot of people are products of the public school system, and I think they are like kind of used to being like drip fed the education and like you do what's presented for you and you get scored on it. And then like maybe if you have parents or mentors or outside influences that push you to go above and beyond, you you kind of learn 
to teach yourself things outside of the school mm -hmm. system. And that's not the norm. Not necessarily everyone learns that kind of thing. And I would say that people who are inclined to start businesses, they are the type of person who teaches this, themselves things, or they find people who can teach them things. And again, going back to that self-starter um, mentality, where it's like, it's not enough just to do the average to get above average results or extraordinary results. You have to, you know, put in way more effort outside of the, the core hours um, to, that are required to actually get extraordinary results. And I would say, you know, teaching entrepreneurs that level of empathy, where it's like, not everyone is like you, like not everyone, you know, it can just build something from nothing. Not everyone can do that is something that a lot of entrepreneurs need to wrap their head around. Um, you know, some people understand that inherently, but like, I, I would say a lot of them don't. So I would say, you know, that that's one thing. The other thing is that, um, it takes, like, if you're someone who is building a business, you kind of need to like learn everything very quickly on the fly because, you know, just things are like crazy situations are coming out of nowhere constantly. Right. Like that's just running and building a business. And so you have to get really good at quickly figuring out, okay, these are the things that kind of like matter to this new thing that I need to learn. And I only need to focus on like these three out of 10 things, really. Like, yes, it's great if you focus on the extra seven, but like they're not going to move the needle as much as these, you know, first three. So maybe like max out those first three. Um, and I would say that, you know, uh, letting, letting entrepreneurs and such know that um, stu their students, you know, might not necessarily think that way and then might not be able to absorb, you know, information as quickly as they can, or at least like get to the core of what's important in information as quickly as they right. can. Because as an entrepreneur, like you are battle tested and being able to do that every single day. And your students are probably not unless you're teaching other entrepreneurs, at which point maybe they are. But in a lot of cases, um, they're just not, they don't have that kind of like just experience. And it's not like a function of like all entrepreneurs are like better or, or whatever. It's just like yeah. they've, they've had time in the ring. They've had, you know, uh, time to like just get good at this because, and they've had to. Um, and, and that's really what it's a function of. So I would say like, you know, those are two things that I'd say business people or entrepreneurs need to, need to kind of understand when they're putting course together. Um, I would say that a lot of the time, when I talk to people about building a course and I find myself, you know, making this mistake too, um, it starts off being very over-engineered. Like you need to learn this, you need to learn this. And it's like, it's so dense that like, just because, you know, you as an entrepreneur have done this and it's like nothing to you. Like, of course you need like to teach all these 12 topics or whatever. Because, and like, why is this so difficult? Like they're, they're easy. They all fit in together perfectly. When you're just starting out, like you need to reduce the complexity, like reduce it, you know, reduce it to what you think is the bare minimum and then reduce it again by half. Um, and, and you really just need to focus on teaching the fundamentals because as much as you might want to try and make this incredibly like value packed, dense course offering, um, the, the actual like, you know, amount that people are going to retain is way less than what you think it is. And the amount that people are actually going to complete is way less less than what you think it is. Um, I know that, you know, and we sell education courses for, for multiple clients and, you know, we've built a bunch. But I know that the course completion rate is not necessarily that high for online courses. Um, and, you know, we, we try and work on that. We try and make it better. But the interesting thing is that we found that even if you survey people who have only done 10% or 25% of a course, you can still get a lot of very positive reviews because they'll say like, well, yeah, I went through the first hour of this you know, five-hour course and it had such incredible insights. I started implementing them and they fix most of my problems. And so like, I just haven't, I haven't gone back to the rest of the course. And that, that's one of those things where it's like, it, there's a big disconnect between education and entertainment in that space. Because with entertainment, if you turn off a movie after the first half an hour and it's a two hour movie, you probably did that because you didn't like it. Like it, it probably wasn't like, oh yeah, this, this filled my like quota for adventures or, or whatever it is.
And so like completion matters in that context. And completion does still matter in, in course creation. Um, but it's a different context and you really need to view it differently. Well, I, th I think you make a really good point there because not, I don't think every course needs to be completed necessarily exactly with what you're saying. Like you may have gotten all the information you need out of the first hour, first half hour, whatever, and then you, you can find your way back to it. And I just think that's a, an excellent point that, that people need to remember, especially when you get into space of, of building courses. So what I like to do here at the end is, is give my distinguished guest an opportunity to leave people with three actionable tactics that they can kind of take away based off of what we've talked about. So what would those three things be for you? Yeah. So I'd say, you know, a lot of them relate to being an entrepreneur and whether or not you're a teacher who wants to become a better entrepreneur or an entrepreneur who wants to become a better teacher, like these are all, you know, equally applicable. Um, I would say that one of the, the first things is take big swings. Um, especially when you're early in your career, like what have you got to lose really? Um, but, but, you know, the same thing goes for when you're later in your career. Um, just take big swings, like bet, bet big, like go for something that you haven't done before or go for something that gets you outside your comfort zone. Uh, go for something that could make a material impact in your life. Um, I think it's important to, to do that. Uh, the second thing would be always get back up. Um, the, the reality is that in most of the best entrepreneurs that I know, they're just, they're so resilient. Um, they're, they're cockroaches almost. And the fact that like <laughs> you can't really kill them, they just keep coming back. Um, right. and you know, ideally they keep coming back better. And the, the third thing is never stop learning. Like I think that, you know, that this goes well with the, the previous point, but you need to like always keep better, keep getting better and always keep improving yourself. Um, I think that the second you stop doing that is, you know, that's when you, you might as well just write off the rest of your life. Um, cause if you're not constantly like getting better, then like, why are you here? If you're not constantly leveling up, then like, what's your purpose? Um, and getting better, you know, uh, or like, you know, never stop learning. Um, like I think those things, uh, like they really make an impact over time because if you're getting better slightly, you know, every week or every year or whatever it is, if you're learning something new all the time, eventually that compounds. Um, and it gives you a reason to, to keep going. Thanks so much for being a part of the show. Now, one of the easiest ways that we can stay in touch is that if you're watching on YouTube, please like this episode and subscribe to the channel if you'd like. And if you're listening to the audio version, rating on your favorite podcast app would mean the absolute world to me. So I'm Craig Shoemaker, and I'll see you again here soon on the Leverage 3 Podcast.